You're listening to The Dental Guys. Is zirconia a crutch? Bob Winter on lithium disilicate. What do we know now? Dentists are so material oriented. Do we need a stronger material? A material that's kinder to the opposing dentition? How much thickness do we need? Can this tooth be blocked out like it's so dark? There's so many things to take into consideration when choosing the right indirect restoration. Bob Winter of Spear Education joins Wes and John to talk about what's possible today with lithium disilicate, otherwise known as Emax. Stay tuned for this one this week on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this special episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. And man, we've had a great couple of weeks, Wes, with some awesome people on. And today is no exception. You know, John, I'm super excited about this because every time that we've brought Dr. Bob Winter on our show, it seems like we've had limitations in time because we're always diving into like workshops or seminars and and we try to fit in little tidbits with him because he's so good at like taking things that are really complex and giving you really simple answers. And I think for this episode, is zirconia a crutch? And where are we at with lithium disilicate? There's no better person to talk to yep. other than Dr. Bob Winter. And we are super glad to bring him onto the show right now. Welcome to the show, Dr. B- Bob Winter. Uh, thanks, uh, John and Wes. It's always uh, great to be talking with you. And and uh, I'm really uh, happy you in, in, uh, reached out and engaged me and look forward to uh, our uh, podcast. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing um, at Spear Education right now and maybe, and maybe a little bit about what you're doing in the midst of uh, this quarantined life. Yeah, it's uh, challenging for all of us, no doubt. Um, all of our campus so. Uh, Workshops and seminars have been canceled uh, currently through uh, mid-May. So uh, that has impacted me uh, because I do so many of the advanced workshops. So, of course, uh, quarantine at home, uh, trying to get out once in a while to go to the grocery store, but virtually uh, uh, we're staying at home and uh, doing a lot of uh, uh, writing for uh, Spear Online and, and doing webinars and creating a lot of content for uh, Spear. So uh, it's created uh, more time to do things like that. Uh, so there's, I guess, some benefits to what's going on uh, from our, our uh, educational model. We're doing so much more online now, and, and uh, we've had a huge impact in the dental community. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen so much good quality content that's coming out of Spear. I mean, I, I, you guys really had, you know, years ago invested a ton into the online platform and over the years have continued that. I, I, that's paying some big dividend, dividends right now for people that are able to engage with that. And I've seen not only, you know, clinical stuff, but also a ton of good business stuff. And, but today we, we really want to get clinical, you know, because that's what our show's really been based on. And we love to talk about that. And, you know, the title of the show is kind of a little clickbait, you know, to get people thinking of when we say zirconia a crutch. Uh, let's expand on what that means. And, and really, I want to focus not so much on zirconia, but on lithium bisilicate today. Um, and uh, when I say is zirconia a crutch, you know, we've talked in the past and we as we've been through the workshops there at Spear about material selection a whole lot. And um, there's been discussion about which materials are best in which situations. And 
I think the question, you know, we are so materially oriented often as dentists and we focus, uh, there's been so many great materials that have come online over the last 10 years. But I want to talk about where lithium disilicate is today, because oftentimes I think we, we tend to go maybe toward the strongest materials. We think, oh, the strongest material is the best, the strongest material is the best. But I think there are some real benefits to this material, as we all know. I really want to focus today on margins uh, to start. And, you know, we, we know that there's different ways to process lithium disilicate and uh, pressing versus milling. And based on our training at Spear, we've talked a lot about marginal integrity with pressing being really excellent and potentially in some cases better than what we can get from milling. Um, I'd like you to speak to that kind of maybe controversy about what which way of processing this material is best. Is there a place for milling? Um, and uh, can we get an, a good enough margin with milling or should we stick to pressing everything when it comes to Emacs? Well, it's a um, great question and opportunity to have some really good discussion. Um, you have to look at it in two regards, I believe. So there are quite a number of dentists that are um, uh, milling in their office, right? So they take an intraoral scan and they design and they mill a restoration. And milling of that Emacs restoration can create some great outcomes, some great marginal fit um, if you have the right preparation design. So the smoother the finish line, the more crisp the finish line, the more flowing the finish line, um, you can get, I'll say, an adequate mill. Um, so therefore, you can get a, a you know, good fit. And the reason I mention um, in office is because in office, you don't have the opportunity to look at the other option, and that's waxing and pressing. So from a dental laboratory perspective, um, the far majority of the labs in this country would for sure wax and press the ceramic because um, if you are milling uh, Emacs in the laboratory, you for sure can scan the dye or get digital information in. Um, but the variability of the preparation finish line is quite high. And the, the irregular finish lines, unfortunately, are the majority, meaning rough, irregular, almost saw blade irregularities. It's, it's virtually impossible to mill accurately those types of um, preparation finish lines. So therefore, if you look at a traditional waxing technique, you can wax into all those irregularities and then you invest it invested gold crown or a gold casting. So once it's invested, you burn out the wax. And then when you press ceramic, you heat up the ceramic in a furnace and the, the ceramic is pressed into the mold. And therefore, the ceramic can get into all of those irregularities on a finish line. So because of that, the predictability of, I'll say, a more ideal fit in a laboratory setting is best with waxing and pressing as opposed to milling. Um, in the laboratory, if it is milled, um, we have more sophisticated milling machines that are more robust. Uh, five axis, smaller burrs are used down to five tenths of a millimeter. So you can achieve you know, a, a clinically acceptable margin for sure. Uh, based on research, but if you compare it to waxing and pressing and looking at the um, waxing and pressing in general creates a better fit. Is this a limitation then, I think you alluded to it some, of the mill itself? And first, that's the first question here. And then you also brought up the fact that most labs in the United States, at least, are still pressing or waxing and pressing versus milling. And do you see uh, the end of that? Like, do you see people moving towards and away from uh, waxing and pressing towards milling and away from waxing and pressing? Um, so answering that question, um, 
currently, and I haven't seen a significant trend um, to get away from the traditional waxing and pressing. And I'd say primarily because of the variability of the margins. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if a laboratory is taking in digital information from the clinician and the clinician is wanting a, for example, a, a modelist restoration, for sure, from a laboratory perspective, I would take that dental, uh, that digital information in, and then I would design and mill the restoration based on digital information and send it back. It would be identical to milling in office. So in your office, the tooth becomes the dye. If a laboratory takes digital information in and sends out a finished restoration without a model of some type, there it would be identical to what's being done in the office. And you could present an argument that the internal adaptation in the marginal integrity should be better because you have a, most labs have a better milling machine. Um, so you can have a more robust machine, smaller burrs, and maybe you get a better internal fit and a better marginal fit. But if the dentist is sending in digital information and still wants a, a I'll call it a model, a opposite model, um, to have either the clinician or the laboratory check the, the milling on that model, that's where that there's a, I'll say, a significant break in the digital world because printed mm-hmm. models aren't as accurate as a traditional polyvinyl impression in a stone cast. So I'm in the process of doing a literature review because I'm doing a presentation uh, early next year on this whole reality of digital and analog world and so forth and looking at the information uh, currently on printed models, for example, um, some of the research and a lot of the research creates unrealistic preparations, meaning that if you look at a, um, maybe the best way to describe it is a, a, as a rim of uh, a, uh, a cup, right? And you see the, the margin would be perfectly um, smooth and at the level, that's not a dental preparation. And yet that's how they're testing some of these things out. And even with an ideal situation like that, um, the research shows that all printing um, situations create a rounded margin. So Mm. if you're milling the restoration out of digital information and you're asked to check the fit on a printed die, you cannot check the fit of a margin because the model is inaccurate. So the technician wouldn't know how to make any adjustments. And then you also consider the fact that your interproximal contacts and your occlusion may be variable because of the accuracy of the printed model. So if it's digital information coming in, um, maybe the best is using all digital information and send it back out without transitioning it to a model. Mm-hmm. So um, the model at the moment is still the weak link. Uh, there have been improvements, uh, but yet the research is still showing there's limitations as far as the accuracy of them. Mm-hmm. That is, uh, I mean, that, that that's really interesting to hear. Not surprising necessarily. We've talked about this on the show before that printed models are our limitation, um, not so much the digital information, but what the the model is uh, kind of lying to us about what we're seeing, but it's interesting to hear that you're saying it's a more of a rounded margin um, than what the the truth is. So I think what we can take from that then is if we want to have the best um, fidelity of what the preparation actually was, then a traditional impression and a stone model are still going to give you potentially the best uh, uh, of that. Uh, And then the other thing we can maybe conclude here, and and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the more, uh, the the better the mill, it sounds like, um, the more it can make up for some of our deficiencies as, as, uh, you know, from a preparation standpoint. But 
um, you know, you've used the word clinically acceptable a couple of times. And, and I want to, I want to dive into that a little bit more because we talk about in office milling. And I think we all know that those mills are not as sophisticated. Well, I'll quote Bob. Um, Bob uh, I'll quote Brad, the dental lab guy, and say that. And, uh-huh. and Bob, you've met Brad, and he says yeah. that you know some of these in office mills are like tinker toys because he knows what <laughs> yeah. it goes into a high quality lab mill, which is like anti vibration, like calibrated mm-hmm. floors of concrete that are so many feet thick. Right. Right. I mean, like that's next level stuff. And that's what's giving you the best milled restoration that you say, Bob, is clinically acceptable. Yeah. So what what does that mean? Clinically acceptable. Let's dive into that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh, that's what I was just going to do. It's um, if you look at what's clinically acceptable, according to the ADA, it's uh, 120 micron gap. So. That means it's 0.12 millimeters, which that's clinically acceptable. And whether you look at a wax and press restoration, and I'll say on a mass production scale or a milled restoration, they mill in wax and press less than that. So it's clinically acceptable. The everyone has to determine their own good enough level, right? And so is it good enough to you realize there's a tenth of a millimeter gap or are you expecting to see a perfect seal? A perfect seal, you could argue, never exists um, because you always have the thickness of your cement and so forth. But um, clinically acceptable is okay. Um, if you want to be in the 50 to 60 micron range, right, then there is a different level of service being performed and therefore that's great. And maybe that's where I strive to be, right? But, um, what is done clinically with mills and what's, and again, the research will show this in laboratory settings on ideal situations, they're all clinically acceptable. But there is a Mm -hmm. range of what's clinically acceptable. So I can't criticize any of whether, like I said, a mass production lab. And again, I'm not criticizing maybe a mass production lab. It could be a one person lab that is trying to turn out a lot of units each day. So therefore, the quality decreases. And if the quality decreases, the marginal integrity isn't going to be as good. So whether it's a big lab or a small lab, it's what's good enough for their clients to accept. If it's not good enough to accept, you go out of business. So then you have to do a better quality, right? So that's where it's a bit of a fine line when when I say um, clinically acceptable. It's according to uh, either research or ADA standards. Let's kind of now sum when up we this, talk about oh go ahead Wes go ahead well I was going to say let's kind of <laughs> sum up this you know idea because we've been kind of hung up on this margin right because mm-hmm. that's where this really the rubber meets the road is how good mm-hmm. are you at prepping right how smooth are your preps if you can prep just like the rim of the cup that Bob was saying right. if you can prep that good and you can do fourteen units in if you're prepping all day long, right, and every mm-hmm. single prep looks like the rim of my cup, then milling might be acceptable for full arch. Mm-hmm. It might, and mm-hmm. if you can, if you can prep like the rim of my cup every single time for your single units, which is what most dentists are doing, right? They're doing twenty yeah, to thirty course. single unit, uh, you know, uh, indirect restorations a day. If you can do that then milling might be acceptable. But I'll just be honest with you, I can't, right? Because I'm Mm -hmm. human, right? There are limitations. There's limitations on how I'm performing in one day versus the next, um, what type of magnification I might be using. Um, Certain people are using different levels of magnification. So what you see under your mag is different than mine. So, Bob, I I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what you can do to get Mm -hmm. your preps to be the best they can be for milling Mm -hmm. and the best that they can be for pressing. Yeah. Yeah. And and to expand on that exact question is 
do you change the way that you marginate uh, mm. if you are going to mill versus if you are going to press? Is your actual marginal design or your preparation design significantly different in the way that you would teach that, or the way that you'd perform that in practice, Bob? So the simple answer is the preparation design is exactly the same. So whether I'm waxing or pressing or milling, the more precise the preparation finish line, the, the better the fit of any restoration, no matter the technique. So the protocol for, for me is exactly the same um, because you're right, we're all human and we create irregularities um, and we don't necessarily see it at the moment we're doing it. And we may not see it until we take the digital impression and you look at it on the computer monitor and you see the irregularities or you take a traditional polyvinyl impression and then most clinicians send that to the laboratory. They pour it up in stone and now the technician manages it and the clinician never really sees it until it's returned back. Um, and you can evaluate the preparation smoothness right at the finish line. So the protocol is exactly the same. Um, the key for me is the refinement step. And that means using slow speed friction grip, fine grid diamond burr. So operating the handpiece between, uh, it's an electric handpiece as well because uh, they spin more, the burrs spin more concentrically or more true. They get less wobble in the, the, the burr. So I can work it with a, as a more precise tool. So the slow speeds are important <clears throat> and the speeds range from 10 to 40,000 uh, RPMs. For me on margins, I'm in the typically the 20,000 uh, RPM range uh, and you have fine grid diamond burr and a steady hand. Uh, I try and use two hands as much as possible. So I'm right-handed holding the handpiece and one of the fingers on my left hand is a counterbalance on the head of the handpiece. So the handpiece is very still. And then I'm uh, just running, like I said, at slower speed. So um, it smooths the uh, finish line. Some people refer to that as polishing. It's really not polishing because I'm not using any silicone wheels to try and create a high sheen. It's just the smoothness that we're creating with a fine diamond burr. So in a nutshell, the preparation design is exactly the same, whether I'm... Um, um, pressing or milling. Gotcha. And now go now that, that preparation design, um, we're going to come back to that a little bit too, when we're talking about, uh, other sides of this with thickness, but I want to get back just for a second into this marginal integrity side, because we did title the show is zirconia a crutch. And so I do want to maybe compare those two materials when it comes to milling, because, um, if we're understanding correctly, the, the difference, you know, is Emax is a one-to-one -one mill, right? In other words, a material is being milled at its at its final shape and size. When we're milling zirconia, though, we're milling it at a, a larger size before it's uh, put in the oven. So the milling can be a little bit better, correct? I mean, we can get potentially a bit better marginal adaptation, do you feel, or a better marginal integrity due to the fact that these irregularities are sort of an amplified size? Do you think that that gives zirconia an advantage from a, from a milling standpoint? Uh, it's a, it, that's a really interesting question. No, no one's ever posed the question that way uh, to me. And I guess I would have to lean on the research when you're looking at the milling of uh, zirconia compared to lithium to silicate. And I think um, they would be pretty comparable, although... Um, milling zirconia because it's in the pre-sintered state is a more fragile material during the mill. Um, okay. So the margins can chip or break down easier than, than the uh, lithium desilicate, although lithium desilicate for sure is a brittle material, so they can also chip. So if you look at actually the best material to mill, it would be some type of composite because um, it cuts smoother, um, more predictably, and actually more efficiently. So um, I'm not sure if you could conclude you can get a better fit 
with zirconia compared to lithium to silicate when you're milling both of them. I, I think if, if there is a difference, I would say it's, it's clinically irrelevant. Hmm. Okay. Because I think that's good to know because I've, I've heard people make the statement that margins on zirconia crowns compared to Emacs, and this is talking about milling, uh, that they're seeing uh, more uh, marginal integrity with the zirconia. I know that I've, I've certainly seen that clinically in my practice. Now, that may be just the, the mill that my lab is using. Uh, it may be just that they're more dialed in. Um, you know, I don't know if, if that's the case, but that's interesting to hear you say that really in the end, there shouldn't be a significant difference between those two materials in terms of the, the marginal integrity. In other words, just because zirconia is milled at a, a larger size, uh, doesn't mean that your milling is going to produce necessarily, you you still have the same limitations is what it sounds like. So, yeah. And so, you know, if I think about the sintering process with zirconia and they, when you center it, the material shrinks 20%. And again, if I go back to a lot of the research that's done, you know, the, the dyes are like the, the edge of the cup, right? And the, mm-hmm. the margin is at the same level. It's easier to create, I'll say, optimal outcomes than if you have the facial finish line at one level, it approximately goes way up and then comes down on a lingual. So now you're, you're milling um, different levels. So when you're thinking about shrinkage of 20%, for me, the math behind all that to calculate it, how it's going to shrink and how it's going to bit is a little mind boggling. It's me. pretty amazing. And yeah, actually it is. And when you think about doing a straight line, that's one thing. If you think about a bridge and you start going around a corner, that's mm-hmm. other complications. So um, single units are for sure easier than bridges. Um, but Again, we go back to what's clinically acceptable. And um, you're noticing that you find maybe clinically you're perceiving a better fitting restoration with zirconia. And then the question I might have for you, have you altered your finish line, um, meaning that you've gone to more of a, a feather edge or bevel with zirconia relative to a shoulder like you would use for for uh, lithium to silicate. So it gets into mm. types of zirconias, but for sure, if you go to a different type of preparation design, like a feather edge or a bevel of some type, um, the perception of the fit of the margin is going to be significantly better because that's how you get it, the best fit um, is with long bevels. But typically with ceramic, and that would be zirconia included in that, you typically don't want any type of long bevels, um, you typically need some thickness at a margin. Yeah. I think one of the things that we've really uh, learned from um, our laboratory and you, Bob, is that once you're digital, stay digital. Um, Try not to move from the digital world to the analog world. We've heard that even repeated here in this podcast. And then we've Mm -hmm. also heard that, you know, you need a good hand piece I think electrics have came up several times in our discussions, mm-hmm. John and I's discussions over the years, talking about electrics versus air-driven hand pieces. And, I'm, and I think that the quality of your burrs and how you're processing those burrs, we could get into mm-hmm. that, but not right now. But I think there's one other thing that we really need to, to speak to before we move on to thicknesses and how these things are finished, because that plays a whole other role into how we can... Um, make these materials work for us is what about scanning for lithium disilicate? We've talked about that a little bit, and we've we've also mentioned impressing, right? I feel like that we really are trying to, because scanning is such a cost-effective, efficient way to operate in the dental operatory. It is very, very efficient if it's done and you're trained properly. But we also have a tried and true material that still occupies probably 80% of the market as far as our single units. And we've not completely moved fr- to into a scanning realm. Is I think we've heard there is limitations to scanning, but right now, 
if we're if we're talking to young dentists or even seasoned clinicians, really, what should we be doing in our offices? And is there different applications for different things here when it comes to impressing versus scanning for lithium disilicate? Um, great question. Um, if you're a general practitioner and you're the majority of what you're doing is um, one or two teeth at a time in a quadrant um, and you have the capability or capacity to, I would say, train staff to allow in-office scanning and milling of the restoration and finishing the restoration chair side to free you up to go to a different room and prep more teeth. So you need to have the staff to support you in that. I think that's a great business model. And that, um, um, of course, there's a investment um, to do that in the scanner and the milling machine. And we know that milling machines have, have are evolving quickly in office. And so you can get better mills. So from a straight line perspective, one, two, three teeth in, uh, in a quadrant, to me, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, whether they're uh, crowns or uh, um, milling composites uh, for a, a MO inlay or an MOD or any type of, of work like that, I think um, you can maybe get some uh, better fit, um, uh, better occlusion, better interproximal contact. Uh, so I would for sure encourage people to go that direction. If you're in a practice that does more sophisticated dentistry and you're doing um, arches, as you mentioned earlier, now it's a different complication uh, because if you, you're not going to do that chair side, you're going to be working with a laboratory, then the expectation is that the laboratory needs to either mill or print a model. And then you get into the challenges of how accurately do they fit. And so, um, the research will show that you can have as much as a millimeter error from uh, if you go to a full arch scan. And so the accuracy isn't quite there um, when you start looking at um, rehabilitations as, a fo- as opposed to simpler cases. So yep. the majority of dentistry being done, we, you kind of mentioned it as we began the show, is you know, one, two units at a time. And for sure, it makes sense to be milling in your office. As we move on in time, I believe that because of group practices um, and maybe more practitioners within the same office or maybe uh, practitioners within a a local distance that's really close, um, maybe uh, uh, technicians might be incorporated into the dental practice because they're trained to do this more efficiently rather than trying to train uh, maybe an assistant or someone that doesn't have that background. So maybe that comes into play as we move forward in, you know, in dentistry is uh, more practitioners have a technician in-house to, to help the process, but it's going to all depend on volume, right? Um, but if, if that's occurring, uh, then maybe the anterior aesthetic cases can be done in office on a two appointment, uh, uh, option as opposed to sending it to a commercial laboratory. Hmm. And I think that that's a good way of, of having some guidelines, you know, as to when we should be thinking about impressioning and when we should be thinking about scanning, understanding those limitations and Also, to speak to in the anterior segment, if we are uh, talking about thinner restorations um, and we're talking about, say, veneer preparations, do you think that we can get the type of uh, resolution and the type of marginal accuracy that we need from scanning, even if it's a single veneer? Uh, Talk about that because our laboratory has we've spoken with them multiple times about some of the struggles they have with seeing uh, even a contralateral tooth as uh, on digital impressions with a, with a printed model well enough to recreate texture and things like that. You know, where do you think our limitations are in the anterior for say veneer preparations and scanning? 
Yeah, a couple couple things come up when you mention that. Um, one is just the physical capability of milling thin restorations. Um, many labs would have to, I'll say, over-design the restoration to mill more predictably because if it's a three-tenth of a millimeter thickness of ceramic, um, you have a high likelihood of that can chip or break during the milling process. So, um, you know, you can over-design it to allow a better mill. And then you get into the complication of um, what is your or your patient's aesthetic expectation for the outcome. If you're expecting it to look like and mimic a natural tooth, as you describe on the contralateral side, um, with a printed model, you can't see any of those details. So then you re- may rely on photography to try and, and um, incorporate some of it. But when you're looking at physical form, you need to be working on that, that model. And I refer to it as a model because a model is an inaccurate representation of reality where a cast is an accurate representation of reality. That's why it was referred to casts and models differently. And we're in the, in the printed world, we're into models, not casts. And so, you know, it's a point well taken. But if I think about, again, what most <clears throat> practitioners are doing in this country, let's say, and it, I would say it's the same around the world, but this country, and what is the good enough level for their patients, right? And what is the expectation of the patients and what is the price point they're paying for those restorations? The majority of the work is done based on insurance fees or insurance plans and you're limited, you're limited on the, the money that's being invested in that new restoration. And mm-hmm. a lot is for being done in a monolithic way. So it's, you can't create the same outcome if it is cut back and layered. And if it's cut back and layered, now you need a accurate cast to see the form and see the fit and so forth, control all those things. So it depends on the level of the restoration. And and I'm not being critical of saying monolithic is wrong. It's not the point. Mm -hmm. The majority of what's being done anteriorly is monolithic. But then expectations have to be set that if it's, Mm -hmm. you know, you describe the lateral incisor, if there's significant decay or large restorations and you decide to do a veneer, um, and it now makes the tooth look 90% better, um, but it doesn't look exactly like the other natural teeth around it, that's reality. And I, I'm, I'm okay with that because that that has to fit into the reality of, again, the patient and the practice and, and the fees people are paying for those services. I think that's a great point, you know, because mm-hmm. as we have to be practical. And, and I think that's one of the things I appreciate about the way you teach things, you know, we go to your workshops, you kind of try to teach, here is the best, the ideal. Uh, You can take it as far as you want to take it, depending upon, you know, your limitations of time and finances. But I think what's important to take from this is if you're having issues with the restoration that, you know, the results you're seeing, these are some things that you can think about as far as what might be the, the the steps you can take if you want to up that quality or that ability to get that result that you're looking for. If that's the requirement, then we can start thinking differently about how we make the restorations. But like you say, if you can create a clinically acceptable to you and the patient restoration using, say, monolithic types of approaches, I think that's great. Let's let's change the topic to talking about. I mean, still the same idea, but talking about limitations as far as uh, material thickness, because this is always something that comes up when we're talking to clinicians about these materials, and especially when we're talking about zirconia versus lithium disilicate. Now, we've heard some changes over the last few months or the last year coming from Ivaclar saying that uh, thickness requirements are uh, decreasing a bit with lithium disilicate and that we can maybe push the envelope to uh, a little bit more. What is your comfort level with that? What do you feel we should be, or what are you teaching as far as say, 
let's talk posterior full coverage restorations. Um, and let's talk about occlusal thickness and preparation design to, to achieve the strength that you need. And let me preface that, John, just a little bit <clears throat> is I think that dentists have this um, engineer's mentality, right? That starts to kick in when you've practiced long enough that if something breaks, then we probably just need to choose a stronger material, right? Mm -hmm. if, if, the, if, if the beam breaks in your house, um, well, it probably wasn't you know, engineered properly or, you know, it's the lab's fault or, or what the material that was used, was it versus thinking like, was the material that was used, was it used properly? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a quick blame mentality, right? Because we do sure. want that quick response. I want to, oh, tell the patient it's the material, you know, definitely the material. We need to switch up our materials and go with something stronger. Right. And I know that mm -hmm. leads into another question, but that's, that's where dentists think like they see something yeah. break. They immediately think it's a limitation of the material. Right. But right. Now so we, we do need some healthy minimums where, where we right. know that we can't blame the material anymore, maybe as much. And, and mm -hmm. I think that while we could get into long discussions, which are awesome discussions about the occlusion situation and what we right. really should be understanding um, just from the material standpoint, do you think that the direction is heading toward a thinner uh, piece of lithium disilicate back there, or or are you still recommending maybe a you know one point five to two millimeter reduction? Um, it's uh, it's interesting because it's going to lead into zirconia, I'm sure, and translucent zirconias. But um, with lithium disilicate, um, Ivaclar uh, from its introduction. Um, of lithium disilicate in 1998. At that time, it was called Empress II. The name changed to Iris, and then they changed manufacturing of the material, and then we know it today as Emax. So that's been on the market for approaching 20 years um, as the current material. Initially, their internal testing showed it at 400 megapascals in strength. Of course, there was variability by different people uh, measuring flexural strengths. Um, but yet, um, recently, and that means now, uh, it's probably three or so years ago, they introduced the concept of, they believe now it's 500 meg megapascals strong, not 400. And I think that occurred because of the introduction of the translucent zirconias and they had a little bit higher flexural strengths. But um, we know that ceramic um, ages when it's in the uh, oral environment because of liquids and, you know, fluids, absorption of, of, uh, of moisture and it decreases in strength, all ceramic uh, that occurs. So... Long story short, what what thickness do we recommend? If you go back to the very beginning, Iva Klar's uh, scientists recommended that maximum bond strength was, uh, excuse me, maximum strength of the material was achieved by bonding of the Emacs. Uh, they recommended that every Emacs should be bonded. But if you look at the reality, if you have a cemented restoration and you described a crown, uh, if you're going to cement, not bond, you need greater thickness of material because of that. So the occlusal uh, uh, thickness of the material, meaning in the central groove and uh, for sure the functional cusp, you want a minimum of 1.5 millimeters. And Ivaclar has been true to that from the beginning. And I think that still makes sense. And that's what I would recommend if you are cement, uh, cementing the restoration. But if you're going to get into bonding of the restoration, uh, in particular, bonding to enamel, so our preparation is not as deep into the tooth, you preserve more enamel of the tooth, you can decrease that thickness to a millimeter. So my recommendation is if I'm bonding to enamel on the occlusal surface, I'm comfortable with doing a millimeter in thickness. If I'm bonding to dentin, so all of the enamel is removed, 
um, my recommendation still would be 1.5 millimeters rather than one millimeter. Although this is where Ivacar would say, if you're bonding, whether it's enamel or dentin, one millimeter is uh, probably sufficient. So if I look at the, the fact that lithium desilicate has been on the world market for, let's just say 20 years, it's been used and abused around the world. Most preparations are, um, on posterior teeth are under-reduced occlusally. So mm -hmm. they're probably closer to a millimeter than the ideal or optimum of 1.5. It's been working, but to suggest that they all can be one millimeter in thickness. I think the risk goes to now it's a half a millimeter, not one millimeter. And therefore, the, for sure, you have to be bonded. But yet the increase of fracturing would go up. So it's a matter of bonding or cementation, in my opinion. Bonding uh, to enamel in particular, I'm okay, one millimeter. But if you think about average enamel thickness on, on a posterior tooth, um, it's in the central groove, it's about 1.5 millimeter functional cusps. It may be as much as 1.7, 1.8 millimeters. So, um, you know, there's a lot of enamel that can be preserved to be conservative, but, um, if you're covering cusps, usually there's a history of, uh, a large old restorations or fractures or something, and that complicates the issue. So you're normally thicker already because of all of that. So I'm, I think people are getting maybe hung up on trying to be, and again, this maybe sounds not quite right, trying to be too conservative because I'm scratching my head a lot of cases. Why do I need to be a millimeter thick? How, I mean, how many teeth do I actually prepare posteriorly that I can be a millimeter thick? I mean, for me and the people I see, not many. Usually I've got greater thickness than that. Bob, do you feel like that most dentists are under prepping or over prepping? Um, it, in one of the workshops I teach uh, at Spear called Restorative Design, I've now probably put through 3,500 clinicians in that one workshop. So I do it 10 or 11 times a year. Um, typically it's sold out. So I get to work with a lot of clinicians. And I survey the group and um, we did some research looking at actual preparations and also the writing down information before you prep based on um, what you anticipate prepping. Um, for sure, the far majority, probably 95% of dentists under prepare um, in certain areas of the tooth, um, in particular anteriorly on the facial uh, preparation finish line, the, there's inadequate reduction based on manufacturer's recommendations. And then occlusally, um, they tend to be underprepared. So in general, uh, clinicians underprepare in the most critical areas. Hmm. Now, when with that in mind, and you, you already kind of knew that we were going this way <clears throat> when you started that, you said, you know, this will probably go into zirconia. And it, it does make sense to talk mm -hmm. about at this point in the conversation where the translucent zirconias fit in with uh with that discussion um now i'd really like to hear what your thoughts are on this because a lot of what we have so far from and again i'm i'll go ahead and put out there we try to read a lot of literature but i haven't seen a ton of long-term literature i don't know that there is a ton of long-term literature on these newer you know 4y 5y zirconias um some of the early stuff was interesting was actually coming out of uh clinician's report, which I know is not a peer-reviewed journal, but still uh, they were showing, they, they cautioned against using these materials early because they were seeing fracture even sometimes on cementation, which was interesting mm. to hear. And it kind of cautioned me early on having not really used those materials much. Um, what has your experience been with those materials? Because when we start talking about this thickness question, I agree most dentists underprepare. So if we know that, Mm -hmm. um, should we be thinking about these more translucent zirconias, at least advertising a higher strength 
Is that the case? Is there still an issue there with strength that we maybe don't know about yet because we don't have a lot of long-term data? Yeah, so where to start on this topic? Um, first off, uh, you look at lithium desilicate, and I just said it was first introduced in 1998. That's 22 years ago. So we're using a material as we know today for um, darn near 20 years. It's been used and abused around the world, and it's working, uh, functioning well. It, no one's having significant failure rates. And aesthetically, um, most people are comfortable with using that posteriorly and developing the aesthetics they want. So now we're looking at newer materials, right? And we're always looking for the panacea. That's going to be the next best thing. Um, zirconia was introduced, the high strength zirconia, which is currently used predominantly for bridge frameworks. Uh, Glidewell introduced the Bruxer crown uh, maybe about 10 or so years ago. That's a high strength zirconia. And aesthetically, um, it was quite poor, honestly. It was it look worse than a bad provisional. Um, so that's where the translucent zirconias are, are, have been introduced. And we virtually have no, I mean, if you look at long-term data, that means uh, it needs to be 10 years or more in, in the mouth. Medium term is five to 10 years. Short term is less than five years. And you are clearly identified. We essentially have no clinical research, even short term. So we rely more on laboratory uh, studies. And okay, so there's two questions, aesthetics and strength. So let me, for my opinion, looking at the aesthetics of the translucent zirconia compared to what we know with lithium desilicate, they're still not as predictable, even in the posterior region. Uh, sometimes they can look quite good, other times um, maybe not so good. So uh, for that reason, in my mind, I would rather maybe lean towards lithium to silicate because I know that's been working for so long and aesthetically it tends to work predictably. I do not want to change or remake in the anterior region, let alone the posterior region, <clears> right? <throat> if I have a change because of aesthetics posteriorly, I mean, you're just burning money when you, that happens. So mm -hmm. um, I don't want a patient to look in and say, hey, gee, doc, I don't know the way that back tooth looks. It doesn't look natural, right? So aesthetics to me still is important posteriorly. And then you look at translucent zirconias. Um, the strengths range, uh, let's say approximately uh, in the 5Y version uh, between 550 and 800 megapascals in strength. Mm. But just in this uh, last uh, issue of the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry, they're looking at the changing in thickness of these materials decreasing the thickness in looking at uh, laboratory studies on failures. And at 1.2 millimeters with translucent zirconias, they were having a 30% failure rate. But when they went down to seven tenths of a millimeter, the failure rate increased to 80%. So we, we have to, again, because we don't have clinical data, uh, short term, medium term, or for sure not long term. Um, we have to rely on laboratory testing to give us more information because there are lots of zirconias on the market and they're not all the same. You can't uh, say if, if one material is tested in that brand, you can say works, but I can't relate that to any other brand because the zirconias are so variable. Um, mm -hmm. as far as a manufacturing quality. So for me, um, it's all about thickness again. And it's, if I, uh, when I first started teaching and introducing concepts of preparation designs on translucent zirconias, I went into the websites of the major players, the manufacturers, and looked at what re they recommended for thicknesses. And the thicknesses range between one and 1.5 millimeters on the occlusal surface. Yeah. So that's exactly the same as bonded lithium desilicate or cemented uh, lithium desilicate. So if it's translucent zirconia um, and you're getting thinner, 
for sure we need to be bonding in my opinion and then people question the the strength of bonding to zirconia that's a whole nother topic we can have for another <laughs> right. day um so um i i think that unfortunately i i don't use them um i've worked with them a little bit to see aesthetically how it plays out but i look at my patients first and i look mm-hmm. at them for 10, 20 years out, and I don't want to be using materials that um, we don't know what's going to happen. I've practiced long enough. I've seen materials come and go, and I'm not certain. Um, and again, I, I'm, I'm sounds like I'm really pessimistic at the moment, um, but the translucent zirconias, we don't know a lot yet. And so I'm not real quick to jump on that bandwagon. But for sure, when I survey the people coming into Spear for the workshops, and again, these people are investing significantly into their skill development and their knowledge development, the majority of these clinicians in the posterior regions are transitioning to translucent zirconias. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's making a huge impact in, in the um, restored material posteriorly, but... Um, um, I think preparation design oh, we create made. the right thickness of that material yep. to be enduring. Yeah, you know, uh, well, this good is so good. It's so good because what you're hearing here is practical information that you can immediately apply. And I think you also understand whenever I hear this, it it confirms for me my journey, right? My journey mm-hmm. as a dentist was built on, I mean, if it's stronger, it's got to be better, right? Mm-hmm. And as you begin to recognize the what materials can do for you and then your limitations as a clinician and what you're able to do and perform, and you're able to kind of like start to kind of put some guardrails up in your practice and say, okay, I can perform within these limits when I'm presented with this type of case. And that yeah, really helps yeah. your clinical decision. Now, John, I want to ask well, this and then, because yeah, I want to ask this. Well, I was just going to say too, there's, it's, if this also just is showing us how, um, materials are now driving practice <laughs> more than ever, you know? Right. And, and I think, you know, when you look at, uh, you know, 20 years ago, you talk about, you know, the development of lithium bisilicate and it was sort of uh, research first, then implementation used to be mm-hmm. the way we did things. And it's now we have now. implementation and it's backwards. And, you know, uh, I mean, we have so many studies. I mean, I remember when, you know, Petra Goose, I think her last name's changed now, Gerta Mullen, I think is her name. And she, she was talking about, this was years ago, how they were just banging on lithium bisilicate in these studies and finding that, you know, there was just, it was amazing how there was just no problem with this material in the lab and in the mouth. And it was just showing its, its strengths. And now we have people literally being driven by industry. And it's almost like these are solutions looking for problems. You know, it's like, we're going to, produce these materials and what is the problem that we're trying to solve? You know, is do we have a problem? And, and then maybe we're creating new problems. And that's interesting to hear you say that people are coming into your workshop already using these materials and you're having to kind of have these discussions. Um, and so it's, it's great to, for, you know, clinicians that are maybe seeing these materials um, to hear it here and say, okay, maybe I need to take a, take a step back and look at the long-term data and is it there because we certainly don't want to be redoing restorations in i mean that's an extreme i hadn't seen that jpd study yet we'll have to look at that yeah, we i need mean to, that's we a 80 percent failure rate i mean that is extremely disturbing because how many of these preparations coming into the lab can easily be 0.7 i mean that's not uncommon i think mm-hmm. for a lot of labs yeah yeah in in a nutshell, it almost sounds um, like a um, it's a scape, scapegoat comment, but you for the clinicians that are working with a laboratory, you need to find out from your laboratory what brand the translucent zirconia your lab is utilizing. 
once you find out the brand, what they're using, go into that manufacturer's website, find out if they have recommendations for the preparation design and follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Um, some of, well, I would argue all the major players of quality manufacturers um, will test out their materials at those given strengths or at those given thicknesses because they do not want failures, right? But yet if they're small players um, and uh, there's more and more materials coming from abroad um, that are uh, maybe um, highly variable in quality, and therefore those those manufacturers probably don't have recommendations on preparation designs and minimum thicknesses and so forth. Um, honestly, I wouldn't use those materials. Um, mm. The material that, in my opinion, again, I'm not, um, I guess, my limited exposure and testing and evaluating the katana materials, um, UTA ML and STML uh, zirconias aesthetically tend to be some of the better ones. And I trust the company from a manufacturing perspective on high quality zirconias. Um, Ivaclar can have some good ones. So some of the major players can be okay, but follow their recommendations. I try and do my best looking at and giving recommendations, but I always go back to do what the manufacturer tells you to do, um, whether it's thickness or bonding or cementation, whatever, always go back to the, the manufacturer. And if it's not working based on what they're telling you, um, that's the, that's the most, uh, um, true way to evaluate, uh, what to do long-term. This feeds mm-hmm. into our last question as we close the show. There's been a uh, sense of, of mm-hmm. I guess, um, you know, well, zirconia covers up the dark preparation, right? And I think that there was a lot of misinformation that was fed to me as a young clinician that made me really leave um, you know, Emacs and even at the time Empress, Empress One to just only the most, ca- only the cases that I knew, like this was a 1M1, 1M2 situation and I could choose an ingot that was going to work and it was going to be okay. And and in posterior teeth, you tend to have, and even in canines, a darker tooth. And and there's, I want you to speak to what is possible today with Emacs and darker restorations and what you need to be providing your lab as a dentist, what information they need. And there's a slew of ingots that are available. And I want you to talk a little bit about ingot selection and how important that is to the final outcome of how this looks. Um, A great question because most clinicians don't understand what's happening in the laboratory and they don't understand as you just described the number of different um, material selections within the lithium desilicate or emax line different opacities the the most common one talked about originally was ht or high translucency Um, and that is a can be a great material um, to think of as an enamel replacement when you get into um, thicker restorations and you get into enamel and dentin replacement, then you get into options as uh, LT, low translucency, and one most recently introduced in the last few years, medium translucency. So the greater opacity, the better the masking ability. So if it is just a canine that is more chromatic compared to the anterior teeth and the patient wants a more uniform blending, you might be able to use LT or low translucency and the lab will determine this based on photographs of preoperative 
uh, situation in a photograph of the preparation. And in particular, if it's multiple preps, how the preps compare to one another. And so then they can determine which is the appropriate uh, ingot to use to mask out the, any mild discoloration. If it's more severe discoloration, then you get into um, materials that are not available for in-office milling, such as MO, medium opacity, or the extreme would be high opacity Emacs. And the high opacity Emacs is um, based on, I'll say, relative thicknesses and comparable thicknesses, probably the most opaque uh, material I've used. Um, so high opacity can mask out discolored teeth, um, but it requires a layering technique. It cannot be finished off with stain and glaze. So MO would be the same. You need to layer porcelain on top of it to build in your final translucencies and colors. So in the Emax line or lithium to silicate lineup from Ivacar, you have options to uh, significantly mask out discoloration, but the more masking required, the more it requires the layering concepts. So anteriorly, that's easy because uh, to develop the the best aesthetics, you always want to layer. Posteriorly, though, we want to do more and more monolithic restorations because we bring the highest strength of the material to the occlusal or functioning surface. But if if you want to compare, I'll say, uh, high opacity uh, Emacs to a high strength zirconia, the three Y, um, at comparable thicknesses, they can be equally masking, but they both require a layering concept to finish the restoration. Mm -hmm. And posteriorly, uh, it would be the same as metal ceramic, no different. The same preparation design requirements. Uh, if I'm going to do a porcelain margin on a, a porcelain fused in metal crown, so same preparation design requirements. They both will use a layering material, which is the weakest of all the materials, approximately 80 megapascals in strength. But that way you can build back the appropriate, I'll say, aesthetics. So whether it's zir high strength zirconia, um, high uh, opacity Emacs, metal ceramic, you can create comparable outcomes because of the layering process that you would have to utilize um, in the finishing of the restoration. Hmm. Well, I think that that goes to show that, you know, this material has a lot more versatility um, than what I think many people appreciate. And that uh, there also that there are certain things that you can only do at the laboratory level when it comes to those types of restorations, if you're wanting to use lithium disilicate um, and, and understanding that, you know, it doesn't mean you just have to go to a different material. It just means you have to understand what all you have available uh, in, in your armamentarium. And I think, you know, what we should all be doing, I think, after this discussion, because we've covered just a, a wide range of, of good things here on this material, is, is what we should be hopefully realizing is, first off, um, talking to your laboratory and, um, you know, having a discussion with your technician about hopefully what you've learned from this and saying, okay, um, where should I be using which materials and how should I be preparing to give you what you need? And also how should I be communicating things like the, the type of ingot that I'm thinking about, or how do we make those decisions together? What type of photography do you need? What type of, you know, prep shade information do you need? Um, because in, it sounds like to me that in, in many cases, <clears throat> we be, may be able to stick within one family of restorative materials to do just about everything. And I think that that is, is what I kind of wanted to, to flesh out through this discussion is, you know, are we really um, on the hunt for something that we already have? And it sounds like uh, that's kind of where we've come to as in, in the roundabout way. Um, so I, I, before we close out, uh, Bob, tell everybody a little bit about um, where they can find out more about you. Uh, what you mentioned you briefly, uh, the workshop that you're teaching. Talk just a little bit about what you're doing at Spear. How can people connect with you? Where can they find out more about what you're teaching out there? Yeah, hey, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about that. Um, 
Yeah, what we refer to campus is here in Scottsdale, Arizona, and that's where we have seminars and workshops. Um, the workshops are three days and I'm involved um, approximately 90 days a year uh, teaching workshops. So I'm involved in quite a number of them. And uh, most cl people, most clinicians learn the best by um, uh, developing hand-eye coordination, not just developing their mind in learning about concepts. So once you start doing workshops, you can um, try things out, uh, practice within the the three days, and obviously get feedback on on what you're doing. So um, yeah, that's a uh, uh, I enjoy that the most, honestly, because that's where I think I can uh, make the biggest impact uh, for clinicians. Um, and so we create uh, written articles uh, online as well as uh, recordings. Uh, uh, we try more and more to create recordings that are course based, but there may be three, four, six different lessons within a course. And we've tried to break those down to, into approximately 10 minute segments. Uh, some of the courses that we created years ago were longer, but we're trying to focus on of uh, specific topics and breaking it down so clinicians can um, get um, salient information uh, um, online. Um, so written online uh, as well as uh, courses online. Uh, some include videos, uh, some it's just more, more lecturing concepts. So um, I still practice in Southern California and uh, tr try and create all my clinical content, treating patients, obviously. And uh, Greg Kinzer and I opened up a new dental laboratory uh, there this past fall. And uh, it's another great way for me to interact with uh, clinicians because they can send cases in and I can help treatment plan and, and uh, give them feedback on what they're doing clinically. So it expands the learning experience uh, for them. Um, not just what we do here at Spear, but also in their real world setting. So uh, awesome. still love to practice as much as I can and, and uh, help clinicians as much as I can in the laboratory world, as well as uh, uh, here at Spear. So I appreciate the, awesome. uh, the time you guys have spent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's amazing to have uh, you be able to speak to, to our audience, uh, because you've got that wealth of knowledge, not only from the lab side, but the practice side, um, practicing with some other, you know, very high level individuals and having seen, you know, 3000 some clinicians, which is quite an accomplishment to, uh, you know, to be able to have seen so many people come through the workshop and to have been able to really impact a ton of, uh, outcomes really in patients that are, you know, kind of all benefiting from, you know, what we've, what we've learned out there. So if you haven't, uh, uh checked out, uh, what Spear Education is doing with those workshops, check it out. Yeah. The, the 3,500 people I put, that's just through one workshop, you know, the wow. restorative, uh, design workshop. And that I, the reason I had mentioned that earlier is it related to preparation design and materials of that specific workshop. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, been hugely received uh, at Spear because they can take virtually 100% of the information and put it into play uh, when they get home into practice. So again, I feel really lucky to be involved with all of that. Um, and I push really hard myself to um, stay current on what's going on to give the best information, but it has to be reality-based, practically-based uh, because most uh, clinicians are out in the trenches trying to provide a, I'll say, a high quality service uh, um, and what they do on a daily basis. So I want to try and help everyone, not just a select group of people that are trying to perform at the ultimate level. So, uh, yeah, again, I, I appreciate it. And I think as we come here. out of this, yeah, absolutely. And I think as we come out of this time of being, you know, shut down, it gives us opportunity to really think about where we want to be in mm -hmm. a month, a year, five years in our practice. And many of us that have been in the trenches, just kind of slogging along, working hard. Um, as hard as this time is, it's also great opportunity. And, and that's the way Wes and I viewed this as a great opportunity to look at where you want to be, reconsider 
where your trajectory is is heading you. And um, if you need, you know, help in setting that, I think that uh, you know, as, as we're not being paid to say this, we've been through the workshops out there. We know that you know, Spear helps you to determine where, as far as you want to go, they'll help you go there. Whether that's just in your single restorations making those better on a daily basis, whether that's in your full arch types of restorations. And we appreciate the fact that there is practicality baked into that, that it's not just, you know, doing the most complex, although you're going to get that too. So uh, we really appreciate you being with us today. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Bob really it's appreciate been it. awesome. And we'd like to get, we're going to, we're shooting to get you and Greg uh, yeah, on. So hang on, hang on the line, well. hang on the line as John closes yeah, yeah, out the show. Yeah, after we finish, we're, we're going to have to set that up because the Greg and Bob show, as we have coined it, uh, is always entertaining and always gets some good one-liners in there. So we're looking forward to setting that up. If you haven't uh, connected with us, with the dental guys, please do so like and share this stream. If this has added value to you and your practice and your trajectory, let us know uh, what you what you got from it. If you have questions for us or for Bob, you can leave those in the comments or send those over to Spear. And check them out over at spureducation.com. I think you'll find a lot of value from that. Uh, you can also uh, go leave us a five-star review. I don't know why you haven't done that yet. If you haven't done that yet, you know, shame on you. It's time. Go ahead and leave us a five-star review. That's how we get our message out to the podcast world to let them know what we're doing, what we're up to, um, and to be noticed when people are searching for good dental content. Uh, it's been another great show. We look forward to giving you lots more content in the coming weeks. So for Bob, for Wes, I'm John. And we are the Dental Guys.